Welcome. My name is Martin Chapman. I'm the President and CEO of Indoor Biotechnologies. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you today. Uh, excited about this uh, uh, American Chemistry Society virtual meeting um, on moving chemistry from bench to market. Um, as a company, we're, we're always interested in you moving molecules to market, and so it's, it's very uh, uh, good to see that this approach is being adopted. Um, I specifically would like to thank Drs. Yuzu Zhang and Lauren Jackson uh, from the Agricultural and Food Chemistry Division uh, for inviting me to make this presentation um, and to attend this symposium specifically on food allergens. These are my conflict of interest statement. Um, the presentation will be evidence-based. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the co-owner of Indoor Biotechnologies. Our research is supported by grants from the National Institutes of Health uh, and also from the European Union. I want to talk today about molecular approaches to food allergy, um, covering four main areas. Um, food allergen proteins, what are they? Um, 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 how, can we, how can we measure them? Uh, that gets us into multiplex technology. Um, this is the latest innovation, really, in measuring multiple food allergens simultaneously. Um, I'm going to give several examples of that. Um, uh, as we go through the talk. Uh, and then I want to finish up by talking about um, the mass spectrometry um, and how we're using that to measure multiple allergens. And to finish up by talking about the latest um, innovation, really, which is the development of human IgE antibodies, monoclonal antibodies to food allergens um, as unique probes for investigating food allergic reactions. So what are food allergen proteins? Um, and what does this phrase active ingredients mean? Well, many people in the food industry think about foods as, say, for example, peanut, milk, or egg. Um, and in fact, while that's true, um, the active ingredients that cause specifically cause allergic reactions are, pure, are proteins that are present in the food which initiate IgE antibody responses. So for example, for peanut, there are four major allergens, Rh1, Rh2, Rh3, and Rh6. Um, and these, pro these account for 98% of the peanut protein, and they, they elicit IgE antibody responses. For many food allergens, the molecular structures are well-defined. Multiple allergens um, um, frequently occur in a given source. Um, the IgE antibody production um, is, uh, they're potent uh, initiators of IgE antibody production um, and such that highly allergic individuals can react to exposure to nanograms or picograms of these material, often with adverse outcomes, for example, severe and sometimes fatal anaphylactic reactions. The nomenclature for the food allergen proteins and other allergens is on www.allergen.org. This is the committee of the WHO IUIS allergen nomenclature. Um, and there are also a couple of other resources on food allergens that are, that are indicated at the bottom of the slide. As I mentioned, um, there's a lawful, we know the three dimensional structures of major food allergens. Um, I'm showing several here. You can see from this slide uh, similarities, for example, between RH1 and, R and GLI-M5. Um, these are trimeric proteins. Each unit or subunit of the trimer is about 60,000 molecular weight, which makes these very large molecules. Um, on the other hand, we have something small like RH2, 17,000 molecular weight, um, very potent allergen. Um, and in fact, for allergy diagnosis, um, RH2 is a better predictive, uh, a better predictor of uh, food allergy for peanut than peanut protein itself. So these um, 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 structures are well known. The functions of the proteins are well known too. Um, and so the question is, well, how do we, from the food industry perspective, how do we measure um, these uh, allergens so that we can do risk assessments, so that we can assess contamination and so on? Now, for the past 20 years, um, this has been accomplished using generic ELISA assays for sort of peanut, milk, or egg proteins. Um, the problems with that is they're produced by several different companies. The assays are not particularly well standardized. Um, as a, you can't really use one, one assay from one company and directly compare it with another company. 
Um, and also, ELISA, you have to use a one assay for each individual allergen. So if you want to measure 10 different allergens, you have to set up 10 different ELISA plates. Now, really until recently, the specificity of these assays in terms of their recognition of allergens was, was not very well understood. A few years ago, um, uh, Dr. Um, Shmali Jayasana at FARP um, in Nebraska, um, they did a study there where they looked at peanut, uh, six peanut ELISA assays for reactivity to RH1, 2, 3, and 6. And what they found was that the majority of these assays, five out of the six, predominantly reacted with RH3. These are the curves here that you can see which predominate on these, on these graphs. Another assay uh, detect, detected mainly RH2 and RH6. So what that shows you is that these two assays are not directly comparable. Um, furthermore, there's been an underlying assumption that these ELISAs measure, quotes, all of the peanut allergens, they measure total peanut protein. And what we know from this kind of study is that that doesn't seem to be the case for peanut. And by extension, it's probably not the case for other food allergens as well. So how do we improve upon this? Um, a few years ago, um, the late Eric Garber, who, who sadly passed away earlier this year, um, started a program to develop what are called multiplex arrays for food allergens. Um, and which it was called, it's, this particular array is developed on the Luminex XMAP system, uh, and he called it XMAP FADA uh, for food allergen detection array. Um, basically, what they did was they took um, pre existing antibodies, polyclonal antibodies to foods, <clears throat> and pooled them together um, and developed um, the Luminex, an assay based on Luminex. Um, this assay used, it, uh, used polyclonal antibodies to foods from at least two different suppliers um, and used foods as the standard. Um, so essentially what it did was it took the generic ELISA reagents and it put them on a multiplex system. Now the limitations of that um, from a standardization and a reproducibility perspective are that you need you use multiple sources of polyclonal antibodies. So there are questions of availability and supply. Um, they observe quantitative differences between ELISA and the multiplex assays, and they themselves acknowledge the difficulties of maintaining suitable standards to actually um, maintain these assays. So our approach um, um, was to look at what can be the next generation for foods. And we've developed what a, pro, a, a, a technology called Maria for Foods. So the acronym MARIA stands for Multiplex Array for Indoor Allergens. And that was because we first developed this technology 10 years ago for measuring uh, exposure to indoor allergens in, in homes, uh, things like dust mite, cat, dog, cockroach, and molds. And this technology has been validated. We've used it in, uh, to assay over 50,000 samples at least over the past 10 years. It uses the multiplex, it uses the same Luminex XMAP system as the XMAP FADA. Um, this is, consists of polystyrene beads with, with fluorescent dyes. You covalently couple a monoclonal antibody to the surface of the bead. So this could be a monoclonal antibody, for example, to RH2 <coughs> or RH1. You add the food, and then you detect that antibody using a detector, um, which is biotinylated, um, and you detect it using a streptavidin uh, a phycoerythrin conjugate. And by coupling different monoclonal antibodies to these beads, you can measure um, multiple different foods at the same time. So this is the instrumentation here. This is a Biorad system for measuring Luminex um, uh, technology. So <clears throat> what are the key features of Maria for Foods? Well, first of all, it measures defined molecular targets, um, whether it's egg, GALD1, GALD2, milk, BOSD5, uh, BOSD11. Uh, the assays are sensitive and specific. Um, we have calibrated allergen standards. Um, and um, basically, every component of the system, the antibodies, the natural allergens, um, uh, that are used as standards um, can be validated and, and uh, independently um, uh, uh, standardized. Um, 
And also, um, this uh, by measuring the individual allergen molecules, um, we also have a method that is comparable or compatible with mass spectrometry. This is an example of Maria for Food standard curves. This is a 17 plex array. It measures 17 different allergens. And you can see a series of control curves here. Uh, most of these assays are sensitive in the one nanogram uh, level. Uh, some are even more sensitive than that. Um, and basically, we can measure and make quantitative measurements um, using Maria for Foods. Uh, the skeptics among you will notice that these flatter curves at the bottom here, which have uh, lower MFI levels, if we actually look at those individually on a slightly different scale, um, we can show we get good um, uh, sigmoid curves um, for these allergens. This is TriA19, which is a wheat allergen. Uh, uh, SESI1 is sesame. Uh, SINA1 is mustard. Um, and so, and these are two allergens that are regulated in the European Union. <clears throat> the Maria for Foods correlates very well with ELISA assays. This uh, slide shows nine um, comparisons for different allergens between ELISA and Maria for Foods, and you can see there's an excellent correlation. We've also validated each one of these individual assays in-house. I think we have eight or nine of them on this particular slide. They were validated for linearity, uh, sensitivity, limits of quantification, accuracy uh, um, in terms of percentage recovery, um, and precision. And you can, um, I'm not going to go through this slide in detail. Um, you can certainly t take a look at this um, um, at your leisure. Um, but we have done independent validations on all of the 17 uh, foods that are detected in the Maria for Foods. So what does this look like when we use it on real life samples? Um, this slide shows an analysis of foods using a Maria 9plex. If you take Nutella, for example, which is a hazelnut um, um, uh, spread, um, you can see Core A9, which is a hazelnut allergen. This uh, uh, Nutella also contains soy, and you can see the soy and milk here, soy, gliam 5, and milk, VOSD5. And if you look at all these other foods, milk, egg white, cashew, hazelnut, you can see that the yellow bars indicate positive results for the respective allergens. So chicken egg white, GALD1 and GALD2. Cashew, the major allergen is ANA03. And these data are in terms of micrograms per gram um, of um, allergen in the food. Um, Bamba here is a food that I'm going to talk about in a, in a, in a little while, uh, which is a peanut puff. It contains peanut, but not any of the other allergens. And then here we have the NIST peanut butter standard, which also contains the major RH3 and RH6 allergens. <clears throat> so reference materials. Um, these are some examples of allergen reference materials from different sources. The European Pharmacopoeia has reference standards for two uh, pollen allergens, BET V1, which is birch, and uh, Timothy grass, FLIR P5. We ourselves have developed our own standards for mite allergens, DER P1, DER P2, DER F1, DER F2. These are lyophilized standards where we have mass spec data on their composition. And a couple of years ago, Stephanie Phillip in our group um, um, reported um, specific allergen measurements in the NIST um, peanut butter standard 2387. Um, um, and so we could get we, we know exactly what the allergen composition of the NIST peanut butter is. This is actually the most expensive peanut butter in the world, but we can standardize it. It's worth it. Buy it. Um, uh, whatever. So if we go to food. Um, we've had the opportunity to use Maria for foods to look at what are the allergen levels in, in milk um, and other uh, reference materials from NIST. Um, this slide shows um, um, levels of milk allergen in the Moni QA milk standard and in the NIST SRM milk standard. And you can see there's about a threefold difference here in the levels of BOSD5. Um, that we have different uh, um, measurements here for GALD1 and GALD2 in the in the egg standard, the soybean, GLIAM5 in the in the soy standard, and this is the peanut butter standard that I mentioned earlier. So <clears throat> um, 
we can certainly use these these assays to define the reference materials in terms of their major allergen content. And we think this is going to be important for establishing um, appropriate food reference materials and standards. So at this point, um, what do we have? Um, we have a um, 17 Plex Maria for regulated allergens. It covers the big eight in the US, as indicated here and also the allergens in the EU that are also regulated. I want to talk briefly about um, the LEAP study uh, for prevention of peanut allergy. Um, this was a study in which they showed um, um, that ingestion of peanut early on in life um, um, can actually prevent peanut allergy if you if you take it if you uh, feed children peanut between six months and a year you can dramatically reduce the prevalence of peanut allergy um, as a result of that study which was very impressive um, by Gideon Lack and colleagues um, consensus guidelines clinical guidelines were changed to recommend the early introduction of peanut um, in high-risk infants early on in life. One of the key foods that was used was this Bamba peanut puff, um, which uh, um, contains about 50% peanut protein. Um, this basketball here, as you know, we're fond of basketball in Virginia. Um, a couple of years ago, we, we looked at the allergen measurements by ELISA in Bamba using US and UK samples. This is a very well formulated product. We had roughly equal amounts of the allergens, RH1, 2, and 6 in the Bamba, Bamba puff. And we could calculate weekly doses of peanut allergen that were associated with uh, prevention of peanut allergy. It amounted to 330 milligrams combined of the three peanut allergens. And this was published in the JACI. Now, since then, a series of companies have come out with other products uh, other than Bamba to actually be given to children early on in life. And we've recently had the opportunity to study those foods uh, in what are called early intervention products. Um, we took um, 25 products from 11 food companies, and they were tested for 13 food allergens using the 17 plex. Wow. So in total, we looked at 56 samples for a data set of 784. The key findings were that um, about half of the products had what we would define as acceptable allergen prote proteins, that is um, de uh, detectable in what we consider to be significant amounts. But there were a hundredfold differences between allergen levels in different products um, and, and also variability in multi-allergen products. We found evidence of cross-contamination, e.g. trace amounts of peanut and egg in, in uh, uh, of egg allergens in, in peanut products. And we found some allergen profiles that were actually deficient from a number of companies. Well, well what does that mean? Um, if we look at, um, this is uh, um, six companies here. If we look at company A, it's a peanut powder. It contains the peanut allergens, but no milk or no egg. Company B contains the peanut allergens, but it also contains milk uh, allergens. Um, and we found significant milk allergen in, these, in this particular product, um, which was surprising because it was allegedly produced in a dairy-free facility. If we take company C, it produces some different products here. You can see the milk product has a lot of milk allergen. The peanut milk and egg has all of the allergens. But the milk products also contaminated a little bit with egg and a little bit with milk, indicating that these products are most likely produced in the same facility. And then we have Bamba peanut puff for comparison. So basically, this gives us an estimate of, well, if Bamba works, we would expect these foods in green to work as well. On the other hand, the three companies below, you can see low allergen levels. Um, if you take this one, these two companies here, E and F, very low levels of peanut. In fact, they seem to have actually managed to get rid of the RH1 and RH3 somehow as part of the, the processing here. Um, and then this mixed food powder, we see some levels of peanut. The milk is certainly not as high as in the other samples, uh, and neither is the egg. So 
we can distinguish between these early intervention products based on their allergen levels. Um, and I think that is, um, uh, pro this is preliminary data. We, we have a lot more of this data to analyze, but um, I, I thought it would be worth showing you that today um, because ultimately um, we, we may need to see whether these differences also affect the clinical outcomes in children who may be receiving these products. So in the interest of time, I just want to quickly go through a few more slides on mass spectrometry. What do we use mass spectrometry for? Well, primarily in our group, we use it for um, assessing the purity of our purified allergens. You can also use mass spec to define uh, specific allergens in complex mixtures if you don't have an assay for that particular um, protein. And you also, it's very useful for processed foods where antibody-based assays uh, may not be effective. This is a comparison of the NIST and the MONOQA samples by mass spec. And you can see on this slide that there are readily detectable differences in terms of percentage of abundance of these um, um, uh, different sets of milk allergens. We have been um, formulating peanut um, products for vaccine development, and we've been formulating them based on their RH1, RH2, RH3, and RH6 content. And you can see in this slide, this was an ELISA comparison, good agreement between the data on ELISA and also on mass spec, um, which is very reassuring. Finally, <coughs> human IgE antibodies. This is, these antibodies were produced by Dr. Scott Smith of Vanderbilt University. You can see here we have panels of different anti, human IgE monoclonal antibodies to different food allergens, two egg allergens, three peanut allergens, cashew and walnut. Now look at the concentrations of these antibodies here. A regular highly allergic patient may have a level of 100 to 200 international units per ml of IgE to these allergens. Look at these levels. 200,000 units of the monoclonal antibody, over a million units in the case of this antibody to RH2. These are phenomenal concentrations of, of antibodies. This SDS page here shows you the purity of those proteins. And we've also included uh, on the left here, uh, binding curves to human IgE monoclonal antibodies to three peanut allergens and to two tree nut allergens. And you can see there's perfect, um, excellent um, um, sigmoid curves um, to these particular allergens, reactivity at the nanogram per ml level. Um, I'm over my time a little bit. Um, I just want to uh, um, summarize Maria for foods. Simultaneous detection of major food allergens, measures food allergens with accuracy and precision. The standard, the, pro the components can all, are all readily standardized, and we believe that Maria can also be used in tandem with mass spec. Um, this kind of assay is going to be useful for screening for allergen contaminants, um, for validating allergen control and cleaning processes for environmental allergen detection, and for establishing risk assessment and risk thresholds based on allergen doses and exposures. I'd like to acknowledge all of my colleagues at Indoor Biotechnologies, particularly Stephanie Phillip and Christina Reed Black um, for their work on Maria for Foods and Brian Smith. Um, and also to acknowledge Scott Smith from Vanderbilt University with whom we've collaborated. Uh, he's getting collaborated with Anna Pomeus to, um, to look at these human IgE monoclonal antibodies, um, which are uh, incredibly going to be incredibly transformative reagents. Thank you very much. Um, um, please get in touch uh, if you'd like to follow up on any aspect of this talk. MDC at inbio.inbio.com. Thank you very much.